Welcome to the Real People, Real Business Show, where we're talking with business owners who are in the trenches, everyday people who are working hard and have relevant and inspiring stories that you can relate to. Everyone we speak to is actively building and growing their business and is here to share their experiences, lessons, wisdom, and guidance so you can be inspired to take action towards your own goals. Today, I'm so excited to welcome Sarah Weisgerber. Sarah is a marketing expert that helps keep your business current and take it to the new level. Through her business, Currents Marketing, Sarah and her team focus on social media management, commercial photography, and reputation management, so you can focus on your business and leave the social game to the professionals. Welcome to the show, Sarah, and thank you so much for taking your time to share your story today. Yay, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Okay, well, let's dive in. I want to hear how you got started, what your journey has been to get to where you are right now. Perfect. So... Honestly, it started a long time ago, so a little bit of backstory going into it. I knew for a long time that I would own a business. My mom is an entrepreneur, and I got to watch her growing up. My dad has worked at the same company since he was 18, so I got to see that contrast between being an employee and being an entrepreneur, and I saw the entrepreneur side and was like, that's for me. That's what I want to do all the way, but I didn't really know what kind of entrepreneur or what I really wanted to do, so I thought I would be a vet started volunteering at a vet clinic when I was 12. I stayed there till I was 20. I loved it, wonderful people, but I knew that that wasn't for me. I needed something more creative and something that allowed me to move and try different things, go different places. So I went to school to be a photographer and started as a commercial photographer. Loved it, loved getting to work with so many businesses and to be creative. Through doing that, they started to ask for marketing help. And I kind of moved into that gap in the market because we were doing our own marketing and they were like, how do you do this? How are you making it work? And it naturally moved more into marketing and social media. And then I fell in love with it. I had learned a little bit at school, but once I actually got into doing it for all these other businesses, it was amazing. I loved being creative and trying new strategies and getting to test what's working and what's not. So that was really the more natural move into marketing. So, so who are you serving right now? Right now we serve a lot of different businesses, all the way from small to medium sized businesses. I love working with people in different industries because I love to see how their industries function as well as how you can maybe apply something that's working in that industry to another industry. So we really don't limit ourselves in a certain kind of business, but more so a certain kind of person that is also creative and wants to work with us and wants to see their business grow online. And how are you finding your clients? So I know that you've made a bit of a shift, right? So you were originally working with a specific type of client and now you're really moving to a new type of client. Tell me a little bit about that and what kind of prompted that shift. Sure. So when the business started, we were primarily working with local businesses. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. We were working with businesses locally. From working with those local clients, we started to get introductions to clients in other countries and other provinces and other states that really matched who we wanted to work with and the kind of person that mended well with our business. So we've started to expand who we're working with geologically, but also more so the person, the businesses, tend to have teams and we're coming in to be that missing piece on the team to help them market. And a lot of that came from us learning those strategies and us figuring out how we can kind of integrate into that business. And what have you noticed about a shift? Like what's shifted in your own business when you, now that you've decided to go in that direction? I mean, money, if I'm being honest, usually the clients have more needs and so do their clients online. They need to be showing up more online. So we're there to help them show up more often and to show up with a bigger presence. I think our processes have changed quite a bit internally. We've noticed some gaps in the market where people were getting quotes from other marketing agencies who were promoting their services, selling their services, but there were some key points that they were missing such as engaging on social media. It's so much more than just posting. You have to be in there on the profiles, engaging with their audience, engaging with a new audience. So we realized that missing piece and have made that more of our focus to make sure that they're being social on social media. 
So as your business has evolved, you have, your services have evolved as well. What do you think? So a lot of people have a really hard time committing to focusing a little bit more, right? Because there's that whole scarcity mentality of I could just take all the clients and then I'll be okay. But you've realized that your focus is really on engagement and engagement being like your specialty and your bailiwick. So has that been, has that felt better? Has that felt scary? Like, tell me a little bit more about your focus. Mm -hmm. I think at the beginning it was scary because I was that person who was trying to offer all of the services. You needed this? Yes, I'll figure it out. I can do it. And at the beginning, I think it was good that I did that. I started the business really young. I was 19. I needed to bring cash flow in. So I really needed to do all these other jobs. But once I really started to find what was working and the kind of person I wanted to work with, bringing it down and really honing it in helped me find that market and made it a lot less scary because I could see where it was going and even having your help to kind of figure out where we're going with niching it down without having to niche down and say, we only want to work with this industry. I think that was my holdback is I didn't only want to work with one industry. I still wanted to be involved in many to get to learn them and work with them. So tell me about the shift from local business, because I think a lot of people kind of get caught here, right? They start Mm -hmm. by serving local businesses and local business can be really profitable and, and a, you know, a great market if you, you know, if you really just double down on that, but what's been different between serving kind of local businesses and then moving towards these personal brands? Mm-hmm. I find the value that they put on our work is a little bit different because they value us coming in to help them build the strategy as compared to valuing us just for the amount of posts that we're putting out because they know that they need an online presence to help their business move forward. So we're coming in to help them promote their online services, their online products, whatever their offering may be, to not only their local network too. They're looking to expand beyond being local. So they need someone who also understands moving out from that local industry. And that's so much, I mean, we talk a lot about alignment, but in terms of you and your business and and the alignment with the work that you want to do, I suspect that local businesses aren't so focused on engagement, but content, whereas what you were really excited about was providing engagement. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they have a story to share and they're sharing that story, but they also know that they need to be there for their audience. They need to be talking to their audience, congratulating them, celebrating with them. And they also need to be reaching out to a new audience to bring more people to their page. Yeah. And I think, well, like, I know that you and I have talked about this, but one of the things that holds people back in that sort of space, the personal brands, is the fact that now they've got someone else managing their presence. So how do you help people get from that fear of having someone else doing engagement for them to allowing you to kind of do your work and see the results? We start with a lot of learning at the beginning. We need to know how they talk, how they interact, what they do. If there's someone who tends to say hooray instead of congratulations, then that's the kind of wording we want to bring in when we're engaging on their behalf. We need to make sure that it sounds like them, not like it sounds like the agency that they've hired to now manage their social media. So we get to know them as much as we can and we do a lot of strategy calls and talking and consuming content that they've already put out so that we know how they talk. And then the other side is just building that trust, letting them know that we know what we're doing and then showing them. So here's some comments we would leave. Here's an example of some that we did leave. With some clients, there is that extra hesitation. So we'll send them the first few to approve before any of them go live, just so they've seen it first and it helps them feel more comfortable knowing what's going on. I think one of the important things you said to me once was that it, like, it doesn't really matter who you are. <clears throat> that process just takes some time and some, some like doing it in order mm-hmm. to, you know, you can't jump into anyone's account and just automatically be ready. Right. 
So how are you, like, do you, have you built a process in place to educate your clients that they can have that expectation and that those fears are normal? A lot of it comes in our initial strategy meeting. So before we start any contract, we sit down and we have that strategy meeting to discuss who they are and usually the first 10 to 20 minutes, which has been our marketing call strategy is to get to know them beyond their work. Mm. Who are they personally? Do they have kids? Do they have pets? Where do they like to travel? What are their hobbies outside of work? Is their only hobby work? And trying to get to know them as well as their business because we need to know who they are outside of that business and then who they want to be online. Helps to pull it all together. And each time we do it, we just run through a form that we have in our project planning software to make sure that we get all these key points and fill them out. So when we first started talking, it was basically Sarah doing all the work and you know, a couple of helpers. And now you've moved into like when, you know, one, one of the things you identified really early on was that the thing you like to do most is the strategy work. And so you were kind of stuck in the doing work, which wasn't all that fulfilling for you. So now you've been on this mission to build an agency and you've done it actually quite quickly. How does it feel now to have a team in place? And what were some of the, what were some of the things you had to go through in order to make sure that you could step away from that doing work and more into the strategic role? So I always wanted an agency. Even when I started as a commercial photographer, my name was never the business name because I never wanted it to be me. It was never going to be Sarah Weisgerber Marketing because I wanted to have that team and that agency. And I have built the most amazing team. I love talking with them. We always have amazing conversations and I feel so fulfilled knowing that we are building this team and that I'm not the only driving force. I now have all these people working with me and it's not my business, it's our business. We're all working towards growing it. And it did happen really quickly. March last year, I had two local contractors. Now we have seven local contractors and three full-time employees. So it's been a really rapid growth. And I mean, that does come with growing pains of learning to manage people, work with people, all the background work of making sure I can pay them, that I have their contracts in place, insurance, everything. Like there's so much more background work to start building a team. But now that they're in here, it's so worth it. And I would say one of my hardest things was, oh, this will take five minutes. This stuff, so I'll just do it. I had to learn to ask other people to help me with these tasks because those were the tedious tasks getting in the way of me doing strategies, ideas, building the business, sales calls. So that's been, I think, the biggest shift is learning to ask people to help and to bring them on board with other tasks. And I don't think you're unique in that being the biggest challenge in moving into, you know, an agency model is being able to ask for the help and be disciplined enough to allow other people to learn rather than just being like, this will just take me five minutes, I'll go. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just been you being conscious of and recognizing that and letting that process take, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't want to be a helicopter boss. Like I don't want to be looked at as the boss. If someone has something that they want to come to me with, I want to be very open and I want them to feel comfortable coming to me. And I don't want them to feel like I'm hovering over everything that they do. I trust their expertise and I want them to know that I trust the work that they're doing. At the beginning, yes, I'm going to be a lot more involved in watching, but then I see their work and I trust them to keep their tasks moving and going. So the million dollar question, how do you find good people? I actually used a hiring consultant oh. to help me. And the first time I hired, I hired a contractor, I think this was like three or four years ago, did not work out very well. And it was okay. I learned a lot from that experience. And this round of hiring, I worked with a hiring consultant and they helped go through the resumes. The first job posting I did, I had, I think, 130 resumes come through. So there was a lot of resumes to have to go through. And she went through, got the top contenders, 
did her interview with them, did the references, and then presented me with the top candidates. And then I was able to meet with them. And honestly, a lot of it was a gut feeling. Like, I know that I will work well with this person and that they have the skills that I need. Some of the candidates were really amazing people. One identified, she's like, I need to know where everything is along every step of the way. Like, honestly, I'm not that kind of person. If I have a task, I'll do it. I'm not going to tell you I'm 10% done, 30% done. So I knew that we wouldn't work well. And for the second full-time position that I had opened up, someone who applied for the first position applied again. And she was so high up in seeing that she came back and applied again, felt really good in talking with her. And now she's so amazing. The work that she does is so great. So I feel really lucky to have found this team. I wish there was a formula I could give you to say you need this, 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 and this, but you need to sit and talk with them and make sure that you'll work well together. Yeah, I mean, I, you and I are both involved in another client's community. And <clears throat> one of the things that this community kind of stresses about is how to find clients and the, you know their skills and that sort of thing. And I keep telling them that it's really not about your skills. It's about who you are and how you connect with the people who want to hire you. So that kind of intuition, I think, helps as well as being really clear on what you're looking for and having the experience of knowing that there are certain nuances or idiosyncrasies <laughs> that um, you can notice in the candidates and almost um, operationalizing those, right? Keep, make, keeping those mm -hmm. as part of your sort of your company knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was really open with anyone that had applied to the job. Like the first full time position, I was like, this is my first full time employee. You are really paving the path for future employees coming into current marketing. And I was just very open to say, I don't have all these processes in place yet. They're in my head, but I'm working to put them in place into processes so that we can keep replicating them. But I need your help to get them out of my head. And it was so nice to start to have those people to bounce ideas back and forth from, and they bring their own unique opinion in. Sometimes it's something I didn't even think of. So it's like, perfect, let's do that. Let's yeah. add that in. Yeah, I think that setting expectations is amazing. And we can set whatever expectations we want, right? So mm -hmm. if you are like half in the process of documenting processes, but they're not done yet, and your expectation is that this team member can help, just tell them, you know, whereas if, if you just kind of let them come to work and let them believe that all of this work has been done already, they're just going to be frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I made sure to tell them all we're growing a team. Yeah. Like this is a new business. This is a new experience for me. I'm so thankful that you're here for the journey. Yeah. But I want your input. Like I want you to also be involved in this journey and to tell me as an employee coming in, it would have been nice to have this, 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 and this, or I think, why don't we try this, 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 and this? Perfect. Let's try it. And so as you're, as you're building this team and now you've, you've grown quite quickly, what's been key in terms of keeping the work coordinated and separately keeping the work at a quality standard that you want? Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of, different processes to get things done, but I would say the most important is a project management software. So we make sure that any client that comes in, we're still kind of refining our onboarding and offboarding process, but when they come in, they have their folder and all of their tasks get put in there. They get assigned, they get set to repeat when they need to repeat so that everybody on the team knows what needs to happen and when. And then within those tasks, there's like, this has to get done by this date, which then triggers a follow-up path with the next member. So there's a process that we follow and it looks pretty much the same for each client, just the content different. So that's the process side. The quality side is really finding people that I trust to put out good quality and that content is being seen by more than one person. It's grammar mistakes happen all the time. It's just a reality, it's going to happen. So having multiple pairs of eyes on this content helps us make sure that what's going out is good and that 
if something needs to get changed, one of us is going to catch that along the way. So we make sure that it's seeing multiple people before it goes out. And then the final person to see it needs to be involved in that client strategy. They need to know the client's goals, what we're working towards, and what's going to happen. Ideally, everybody knows that, but we need to make sure the final person to see it knows that client so well that they know what to put up. How has your marketing changed as you've shifted your focus? I would say it's a lot more strategic in how we're talking to people. We're also working on evolving our own marketing strategy. I did none of my marketing for so long. I got so busy with clients that mine fell off and that's where I understand that someone needs an outside contractor to come in and help them with their marketing. I didn't have time for my own. I think there's a saying that says your hairdresser will always have the worst hair or whatever it may be because I didn't have time to do my own. So I understood those stressors. When I built my team, I handed that off to one of my team members because I knew that I was still busy and that I needed someone to come in and be that pusher for the content. And at the beginning, a lot of what we were putting out was more so like, here's what we're working on. Here's what ha- here's what's happening. What we're working to implement now is a lot more actionable strategies. Here are things that we use for you to try in your business. I love giving out as much content as possible and as much information as possible. I'm happy to provide free information without saying, here's five minutes of help. Okay, here's my bill. No, I don't operate like that. I talk way too much and I give out as much information as possible because I love doing it and I want it to present that way online. I don't want people to feel like they have to send us a message or they have to book something to get some sort of value from the content that we're putting out because that's how I talk. I'm not afraid to give away the secrets. Is that working? Like, it you- is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of questions that are like follow-up questions from the value that we've already given that help to spark those conversations. And I always tell people, Social media may not be your main driving force for clients. For us, our main driving force for clients is referrals. But we have gotten some from social media. Like our top platforms are Instagram and LinkedIn. And that's where we start those conversations, which eventually lead to working together. And how are you, like, as you're getting more and more leads coming in, how are you making sure that those are converting? A lot of it is just with being open and having that conversation, finding out what they need. If I can't help them, I want to be honest and not try and pressure them into working with me anyways. Or if their needs are beyond what we can offer, I will help them find someone to help them. And honestly, most people that come in, they're like, oh, you do digital marketing. Great. I need a website. Awesome. I think you do. Here's some really amazing people to work with. I don't do websites. And sure, I could come in and try, but it's not our focus. It's not my specialization. So I want to make sure that we're giving them something that we understand. And then just being honest and saying, yes, we've worked with someone like this before. Here's how we can help. Or no, I've never worked with someone in this industry, but here's all these ideas that I have that could be super fun. You've recently had some work done on your brand. Um, Mm -hmm. some copy, that sort of thing. Tell me what, like what emerged for you? Like what really defines your business? Big idea that came out from all of that, which was really amazing to have outside people kind of picking out what's in my brain and putting it onto paper is that idea of engagement and being social and sharing your story, but also being current, current marketing. What's the emo- what, what, What's the driver though underneath, like what's the belief and the value underneath the engagement focus? Really bringing your audience and new people all together and offering them something. So being social, you have to be present and you have to be social online for it to work. You can't post a picture and then disappear for a week. That was not the original idea behind social media. You have to be on there and it can be hard. Weeks get busy and that's okay but you need to be consistently talking with your audience. Send them a message. Maybe they posted something really interesting. Ask them a question about it, but you really have to engage and be social. But I think that's sort of the, um, that's sort of the big problem that personal brands have 
with using social media as a marketing platform is just having the time or the desire. That's the place that they often feel uncomfortable is the engagement side, right? Having the time to be social on social media, unless you're like an influencer and that's your, your only thing, or you have a dog like I do now. <laughs> it's really hard. It's like, the, it's really hard to make the time for that. Cause I think people are also still stuck in this idea that being on social media is like playing, right? It's, it's a time waster. So I, I think you're kind of really well positioned in that regard. Um, it's shifting that focus because that is this, that's the sweet spot of the challenge, right? Like I can create content. Sure. Mm-hmm. But having the time to sit and engage and have meaningful conversations I just don't have the time Mm -hmm. and a lot of people they they're like oh I'm just sitting and scrolling Instagram there's so many other things I could be doing that they don't see it as that driver whereas for us we sit down and we engage for 15 minutes and we're awesome look at these conversations starting look at the followers coming in like we see those direct results where I think a lot of people miss that link of this 15 minutes that I took is now resulting in a new audience member that could result in a client. And I joke with people all the time. Our job is to sit and scroll social media. Well, it's not, is it? No, but that's what they yeah. start to see is, Oh, you're just sitting on Facebook all day. Well, if you were just sitting and scrolling, that would be a big mm-hmm. of time. Like what you're actually, and I think this is what people miss is that it's not just scrolling. It's you actually have to be part of the conversation and part of the community because even if it's just a, like a community of interest and you leave a comment or you leave something thoughtful, people are going to notice you, right? You don't have, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be marketing. It doesn't have to be like telling people about your products or your services or whatever. No. Just becoming known, right? Mm-hmm. And you have to be strategic about who you're engaging with. Yeah. You can't just go in. I mean, you can, that social media, you can just scroll and engage with whoever you want. But when we're engaging, we're looking at their target market and at their goals. So we'll use a random business as an example. Let's say they target moms with kids that are newborn to four years old. So typically the baby to toddler. We're going to be in there engaging with mom influencers who these moms are likely following, the moms themselves, the brands that they like to buy from, the brands that they find value from. So we're starting to show up in all these different circles. And now we start to become memorable from the value that we're offering. We aren't going to show up in those comments and say, hey, buy my service. Yeah. No, if they post something, we're going to respond to their call to action and leave something genuine and authentic on those posts. Well, and that's the, I mean, that's really the the key with social media is to be authentic, right? And I know that that term gets bandied around a lot and is a little bit eye rolly, but it is. It's about relevance, context, and authenticity. Mm-hmm. Even yeah, and being authentic is more than just here's a real day in my life. No. Like you have to be a real person, even though we're coming in and we aren't that person. You have to show up like a real person and have emotion. Show who you are. Yeah, I and and I think that that's so unique. I think engagement gets tacked on to the back end of a, like a content strategy where it really should be the other way around where the engagement strategy is actually your primary strategy and your content kind of supports that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you need to keep that top of mind when the content that you're putting out, okay, who should I engage with and who do I need to see this content? And then don't leave it out completely. A lot of people leave engagement out completely you're posting, but who are you posting to if you aren't going to go and engage with those people? Yeah. Your content is there to support your brand once people find you, but they still have to find you. And the yeah. how you're kind of dragging people over into your audience. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So what, tell me a kind of the most pivotal moment you've had in your business. I think it was growing my team realizing that it's not just me and I don't need to be the driver for everything. Any business owner will know your to-do list is forever growing and you will never hit the end of it. And that's something that I've come to terms with is I will always have a to-do list. But being able to bring in a team to support me with that to-do list has been amazing. And 
this time last year, I was working as soon as I woke up until I went to bed all weekends. Like I just didn't stop working and don't get me wrong. I love working. When I was in school, I had four jobs because I am a true workaholic. I love it. But I also had to realize that I am going to burn out and I was burnt out. All I was doing was working and I had no rest. So now growing the team, I'm working a lot less in the evenings. I'm not taking every evening off, but to know that the tasks on my to-do list are not urgent. They don't need to get done the second. I'll put them on my priorities for tomorrow morning. I can take this evening to spend with family, to go outside, to do things outside of working. And I found that taking the time to do that stuff outside of work is when I get my best ideas for work. Because I would randomly think of something that's going to work. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you, if you immerse yourself so entirely in one thing, you lose the context that makes that meaningful. Mm -hmm. right. And you get less excited about it because you're doing it all the time. So if I was able to step away, perfect. Vacations is when I do my most planning. I, th I have been warning people for a long time that the minute they start feeling resentful, that's a real trigger that your balance is way off and mm -hmm. that you are losing that creativity and that, that like the reason why you're doing this. So let me ask you that. What's the, what's the reason? What's the why behind this business? Honestly, it is to be somewhere warm on an ocean. I don't intend to grow the business and then abandon it. I would like to still be involved. And, you know, maybe one day it comes to the point where I'm going to sell it. I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm not at that point. But the end goal is to end up somewhere warm with a beach where I have that nice balance of enjoying some time outside, walking on the beach, coming in and helping other businesses while helping my own. That's the ideal balance. And I think I'm growing it at a very nice pivotal time. I'm still young. I don't have a family that I need to care for and support yet. So I'd like to get it up and functioning enough. So as I get older, I have to focus on life. Yeah, I love that. And I think I love what, what I love about you and the way you've approached this business is just you're so calm and intentional. And every time there's like the next stage, you're just like, okay, let me just get it done and do it. And so what do you attribute that that in sort of intentional discipline to? I think how I was raised, knowing what needs to get done. And my mom and I mirror each other a lot. She's also that idea maker and that driving force in her business, but she knew that she had to grow her team to help her support all her ideas. I'm a very big thinker. I think like, okay, in five years, I want this to happen. So what do I need to do leading up to those five years? I'm very like in the future thinker. But that helps me think of that far goal to then break it down into all those small goals that I need to accomplish to get there. That's awesome. And it's quite unique because I think a lot of people who think longer term and who have that bigger vision actually live with a lot of anxiety, right? Because they're always thinking, oh gosh, I'm not there yet. And really what you've recognized is that that next step they need to go to, which is like, okay, so how to break that down to those little bitty steps that are all pushing me towards that goal and making that progress. Mm -hmm. And I think I am a very anxious person. It is who I am. And I get anxious. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and say, like, I'm 23. I haven't done all this yet. Like, where am I going? What am I doing? And then I stop and I'm like, you're 23. It's okay. You have time. Your next step is this. Let's focus on that. Yes, I'm really excited for this goal that'll come in 10 years. But for now, let's focus on this. So I need to like calm myself down. And then usually I always have notebooks everywhere. So I'm like, if I can just write out what I need to get done, calm because there's a plan. Well, there's the, the processing, right? Like that's such an important piece is having a container to, even if you know that executing on whatever ideas you have right now is probably not realistic having the container to sort of put them in a parking lot and work through them a little bit more methodically is such an important part of keeping that anxiety at bay, right? Keep, keep, keeping that tendency to just tornado at bay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And knowing what's coming up, I, when I go somewhere, I look up what it looks like because I want to know what to expect when I get there. So it's the same in my business. I want to know what to expect when I hit these milestones 
So I'm prepared for them and I know what I need to do to get there. What kind of advice do you have for people to ensure that they can stay in that kind of progressive mindset rather than getting overwhelmed by it all? Write it down. Write down every step. It could be as simple as my next step is opening up the notebook. If you can break it down into all these really small steps, it feels a lot more manageable because it's not, I need to build a website. It's, I need to decide on which platform I'm going with. I need to decide on the colors and work with my graphic designer. Like if you can break it down into really small pieces, each of those pieces is only gonna take a few minutes. It feels a lot more manageable. So if you can break it down as small as possible, sure your list is gonna be really long, but when you start working through them and you see how quick it is, it feels so much better to know that you're moving forward. And then how, like it feels so good to cross stuff off your to-do list. Now you're crossing off all these things. Yeah, and they're little, but they mm -hmm. they all contribute towards that bigger goal, right? So every little step, this is what I teach my clients too, is break everything down into something you can do in an hour or two. Because then you know you've done it you and you know you've made progress and there's something psychological about checking things off a list. Mm -hmm. It feels so good. And I love having physical lists. Yeah. And now as you grow... Um, and you start to move into a higher level business, you've had to adjust your pricing. You've had to make some, you know, some big mindset shifts. What do you anticipate is going to help you continue on that path to growth? I think a lot of it is just doing it. And you helped me so much in the shift from not charging enough to survive to charging a fair amount for the services that we're offering. And the serious part was that first proposal, that first quote is saying, this is our pricing to someone. Because we worked through it, we planned it, we put it all together. You and I went back and forth a lot to make sure that it was all set up. But that first step was telling someone and it's so much easier now that I've done that first. We've done more since. So you made a significant change to your pricing. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like how, what, what was that change and how, how big of a change was it? And how have you kind of moved into that? Mm -hmm. So our pricing went up, I probably have to check my math. Math was not my strong suit. So that was never an industry I was going into. But I think it would have been 300% to what it was before. So 300% growth, which when I was looking at a local market was crazy. Nobody here was wanting to pay that. But when I started to do more research on other agencies that were more international based or in the States, in bigger hubs in Canada, my new pricing is still fairly low compared to what they're offering. And their agencies are around the same size. So it was almost like I needed to be validated by other people charging that to see that it can happen. And when I started, I didn't know what to charge. So I just kind of threw out a number and every year slowly grew it from there. But to sit down and look at how long is this taking? How much am I paying someone to do this? How can I calculate that to put it all together so that I'm not losing money for every new client that I take? Well, and you know, I don't know how many times I've said this, but I'll say it again. Your pricing is there to support your brand, right? So everybody wants like a formula. So for you, because you have a team and an agency and, and services that you offer and expenses, most certainly we needed to know what was kind of your break even, but more to the point, we needed to get you to a place where people understood where you stand in the market. And I think that was almost the more important part of your pricing was being able to signal to your ideal clients that you're for them, right? Mm-hmm. And it got to the point where we were too easy of a decision. We told someone our price and they were like, sign me up. Yeah, 100%. And we moved from charging Canadian to US dollars. So someone in the US heard our pricing and they're like, in Canadian dollars? Oh yeah, like when can we start today? Because for them, it was such a low price compared to the market there. Okay. So let's, let's change tack a little bit. And this is a question I ask everybody and I'd love to hear your perspective on it. And this is an important question for you because you're part of, you're part of creating those messages for a lot of different people. 
but what's different between what we see out there about business and online business and what's actually real about being a business owner? I think there's a lot of like big dreams and those gurus who are like, I started my business a year ago. I drive a Lamborghini. I'm making seven figures a month. And they boast all these numbers and it's not the reality of it. You can go and rent a Lamborghini for a day and say that you own it. Most people aren't going to fact that you want it. And I had a really interesting conversation with a connection from LinkedIn. He was looking to start his own agency. So he asked if I could sit down and just talk through my experience. And in talking with him, he wanted to do digital ads. So he's like, all I need is some clients because I'm going to charge each of them $2,000. And now I'm making $20,000 a month. He's like, so yes, you're charging them $2,000, but you're probably going to spend the majority of that on their ads. That's not money that you're taking in. So now you have to subtract their ad spend, the platforms that you're using, the software cost, your cost to pay yourself, to pay your business partner, your electricity, your Wi-Fi, like all these expenses. Yes, you got a client for $2,000 a month, but you aren't making $2,000 a month. And I think that's a concept that's missed a lot. Someone can boast and say that they make a million dollars a year, but how much did they spend? They could have spent $900,000, $95,000. Like they didn't make a million. Yeah, I, I mean, I know examples of, of business owners that are like that exactly. Like they made a million, mm -hmm. but they spent, you know, 950000 to get there. Mm -hmm. So you made $50,000 on your business. Yeah, which if that's what you need to survive, amazing. Fine, but, but that's a pretty mm -hmm. different, it's just a pretty different story. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, the top line is not the end game, right? Yeah, and I think just following what you want to do, not listening to those gurus and saying, oh, I just have to buy their $3,000 system every month, and then the system will do the work for me. No system will ever do the work for you. You have to be that driving force. At the end of the day, it's you that is the driving force. And when you wake up in the morning, you can't just decide not to be that driving force. Yes, you need time off, but you have to be that driving force still, even if you aren't present all the time. Yeah, it all comes down to you, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if there's a problem, usually you are the final person. And I think when I'm talking to people or parents, I tell them, get your kid to work in a customer service-based business. Get them to work in a restaurant, even fast food, somewhere where they're having to deal with customers and people. And you're going to learn those skills of learning and working with people and taking responsibility if something goes wrong. You can't just say, oh, it was so-and-so's fault. At the end of the day, it comes back to you. So you have to take that ownership to say, I'm sorry, I should have known how to do that. Or now I'm aware of how to do this. Yeah, that's a really good point. I like that. So what's next for you? Keep growing. <laughs> yeah. Ideally, a lot of my focus right now is the background work that I neglected when I got really busy with client work. So in the last year, a lot of my focus has been building the, key, the team so that they can take care of the client work. I don't want to 100% step away from that. I still like to see what's going out and what's happening. But now my driving force is the business. I need to grow the business so that we get more clients so that we can sustain it. But also like my website, I looked at it last week and it still said copyright 2019. Not 2019 anymore. So updating those little things that I just let fall to the side while I got busy. Now I have time to focus and have team members that can help me with that to get us back to those standards that we need to uphold to help our clients trust us more we tell them how important it is to be present online and then we aren't. So what, what type of growth are you looking for? Ideally, I'd like to grow the team even more while growing our clients, but also finding more of those key player clients that like to work with us. I love working with people who are involved. They like to be involved in their strategy. They like to know what's going on and they have ideas too. Yes, I love ideas and I love coming up with ideas, but I also love hearing ideas. When someone comes to me and says, I think this might work really well. Amazing, we're gonna try it. What else do you have to support this? What do we need to get to support that? So incorporating more 
clients like that, I would say, is one of the next steps. And then also refining how we're finding our clients to make sure that we have those processes in place. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see you grow. I can't wait to see what you do. Like you've done so much in just the last six months. I can't wait to see what you achieve in the Thank next you. six months and, and how you kind of manage it and watch it grow. Um, it's going to go fast. Yes, it really does. Um, we're coming up on time. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Can you tell our listeners how they can find you? Sure. So probably the number one spot to find us while we're working on our 2019 updated website is through Instagram, which is at Currents Marketing. So that's where we are most active. Sometimes I'm not logged into it. I'm logged into client accounts, but someone along the way will be logged into that account. That would be the best place to come and find us. And that's where we're putting out the most content right now. So watch out as we refine that strategy and you'll start seeing more and more content from us. We're trying to get more personal in our own strategy. So hopefully you'll see some of our faces soon. But right now, Instagram at Currents Marketing would be best. Awesome. All right. And that's a wrap for this episode. Such an amazing conversation. Make sure to go and check out Sarah and her incredible business and the content she's creating. And finally, I'd love for you to join us for our next episode where we're going to be speaking to Sari Abraham, who has founded his financial services firm to cater to those that are sick and tired of marketing trends and risking their money. If you're looking for a better way to grow your wealth that doesn't require taking unnecessary risks, join us next week and hear his perspective. And thanks for being here. If you've enjoyed today's content, I'd love for you to give us a review on whatever platform you're on. This helps us share these stories with an even bigger audience. And until next time, keep building, keep dreaming, and keep being real.